Hello and thank you for joining me and my guest today is an interesting guest who is an assistant professor of journalism at Graduate School of Journalism at Columbia University. He's also the adjunct professor of history at John Jay College in New York and he's the creator of Black Star News and an author of two books. The first one being Heart of Darkness, How White Writers Created the Racist Image of Africa published in 2002. And his latest book titled Manufacturing Hate, How Africa Was Demonized in Western Media, published last year in June. Having said that, Professor Milton, thank you for joining me today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Renata, for having me on your show. Awesome, awesome. I hope you're going to have quite an interesting conversation. I look forward. By the way, uh, you, you look quite healthy for someone who has just uh, turned 60, and congratulations on that. <laughs> 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 Thank you. You know, it's all about yeah, it's all about eating right, trying to exercise and slowing down a little, you know. <laughs> mm. That's really nice. I mean, so you're someone who likes exercising. I also love exercising. Oh, definitely. I mean, mm -hmm. exercising a lot. I have started exercising since when I was in grade four and I, I never looked back. Same here. Since the age of, I think, 10, probably. How long do you usually sleep? Right, because I think nowadays, you know, in a culture yeah. that individuals don't want to sleep, because when they f yeah. they sleep, they feel lazy and they want to work, uh, you know, many hours and you know, like late nights right. and just get the few hours of sleep. How does your sleeping schedule look like? I try to get as much as I can. It's very difficult, especially the, with the teaching, with the with the journalism as well. But I encourage people to try to get at least five hours. I know even that is tough sometimes, right? Um, I mean, obviously, ideally, they try to, try to get eight hours, but you know, often that's not possible. But you pay a heavy price if you don't get enough rest, right? Yeah. Uh, so I think perhaps also that is one of the reasons why I try to exercise and eat well to compensate for not getting enough sleep. But I try my best to get at least five hours. If I'm lucky, even six hours. But I will tell you an, an incident that happened many years ago. Um, I went for my regular checkup to a doctor and we went through the procedures. Then the doctor picked up the phone and called the nurse and told the nurse to come with a wheelchair. So the nurse came with a wheelchair and the doctor told me to sit on the chair. So I'm like, wait, what's going on? He said, we need to take you to the emergency room. I said, what are you talking about? The doctor said, I think you're having a heart attack. So obviously I'm shocked and very concerned. So the hospital was right across the street from the doctor's office. So they wheeled me there, you know, they put all those gadgets on me. And obviously I'm concerned about my health, but then I was concerned about something else. I was concerned about who would write the headline for the front page story for my paper? So I was insisting the nurse should call my layout person so I could dictate the headline. And the nurse looked at me and said, listen, you are having a heart attack and you could pass away. You're not asking me to call your relatives, but you're asking me to call the layout person, what's wrong with you? And then I reflected, but then I still insisted on her calling. She refused, but I dictated the headline to her and she called my layout person and dictated it to him. And then I was overnight at the hospital. Then in the morning, a couple of doctors came and checked me and said, okay, how many hours do you sleep? I thought, I said, well, maybe sometimes two hours, three hours. And do you work out consistently? I said, uh, no, whenever I can. What kind of foods do you eat? I said, well, you know, I'm busy. So sometimes I get, you know, pizza or, you know, cheeseburger, you know. And the doctor said, if you continue like this, you're going to die. Because even though you did not have a heart attack, you have so much stress on your body it looked like the symptoms of a heart attack. That's how bad it is. So, you know, I took from that warning, I took it very seriously. I was working, as I said, I've been working out from a very young age, but not consistently. But after that incident, I started eating better, healthy food, 
and started working out consistently. And I would always insist on getting definitely more than two hours sleep. You see? <laughs> and that's how when you asked me, I pushed for five hours. Five hours, anything beyond that is bonus. Mm. And you know, you try to work, you try to work efficiently so that you still give yourself time to sleep. And you know what? When you're sleeping, the world is not going to go away. When you wake up, the world is still going to go there. And whatever contribution you can make to improving the world, making it a better place, you will do it once you wake up. But the bottom line is, if you push yourself so hard that you pass away, you're not going to help yourself, you're not going to help anybody. <laughs> Definitely, that's really true. And it's quite surprising, you know, because especially for young individuals who are actually trying to be entrepreneurs, right? You know, like right. usually, yeah, there's a cliche that, you know, entrepreneurs don't sleep, they work hard all the hours, you know, right. every single time you're awake and stuff. But I think in the long run, it's really not beneficial, right? Because if right. you're not healthy, then you're not able to do anything, mm -hmm. right? In fact, Absolutely. there was a time I was actually, I was sick. And, mm -hmm. you know, the moment I was sick and seeing that I wasn't able to do anything else, it reminded me that, you know, I really have to take care of myself because then Absolutely. if you're not in a good condition, then, you know, you can't really do anything anything without doubt when you're uh, healthy physically it affects everything mentally you know psychologically you just feel better and that is why with me it's a full package you have to mm -hmm. take care of the body so that the body can also take care of the mind absolutely and i think i am worried because right now a lot of, of young people they're usually eating a lot of junk food Right. Yes. And with junk food, I think we really have a huge problem, at least in Africa. Still, I mean, organic food is available. It's not that expensive. Yes. Right. It's not compared to the U.S. And I think no. it's like we should push more young people into feeling proud, eating healthy and organic food rather than, you know, going for junk foods. I'm glad you said that. They need lessons about that, though, because when they see the commercials, right, they see the advertisement, they're seduced by the junk food, the pizza the fried chicken, the KFC, the McDonald's, you know, the Burger King, all extremely unhealthy with a lot of additives <clears throat> and preservatives. It does a lot of damage, not only to the body, but to the mind as well. And unfortunately, junk food is spreading throughout Africa right now. <laughs> it's a huge Possibly problem. In the urban areas. And when, in fact, in countries like the United States, increasingly, I mean, obviously, people still consume a lot of junk food, but also a growing segment now appreciates organic foods, as you said, healthier yeah. foods. Yeah. So how can it be that when we have abundance of that back on the continent, people are running away from that and being seduced <laughs> by the unhealthy uh, food? It's not good. I think we need to have more advertisement promoting the benefits of organic food, but we need to have conversations about it as well, just as we are doing right now. It usually, I mean, you know, frustrates me when young people go to, you know, KFC or McDonald's and they take pictures and they're really excited mm -hmm. and they're feeling happy and, you know, it's just... <laughs> <laughs> no, but we need to, we need to counter that with people taking pictures, posing with uh, organic foods. Organic you know? foods, yeah. <laughs> you know, cassava. <laughs> No, absolutely. You know, yeah. let's let's do let's do music about that as well. You know, yeah, definitely. Let's celebrate, celebrate health. You know. Yeah. And, and, you know, it goes, goes back to the same story, you know, speaking about being advertised young food. I think that yeah. is what has been happening in the continent for, for, for a long time right now in terms of how yeah. the continent has been branded, right? As how we spoke in your book, yeah. you know, how racism, you know, it's used to manufacture hate. And I think it's, it's clearly time that we start telling our own stories, right? We start telling our own narratives of how the African continent right. is and how it should be perceived. And this otherwise, if they're the ones writing the story, it's like them controlling the media, right? And saying what they want to say about us and you know at the end of the day we don't have the opportunity to defend ourselves and we just take in you know what has been given to us yes we celebrate outsiders we don't celebrate the good things we have mm -hmm. we don't celebrate our own heroes if you don't celebrate your own heroes you don't celebrate yourself there's no way that are you going to be able to accomplish much in life because in order to accomplish much in life <clears throat> you need to have a vision you need to have an imagination of a different type of Africa and what role you can specifically play in creating that new Africa. <clears throat> Excuse me. But you can't have that role 
or play that role rather, or have that image, if your image of Africa is also influenced <laughs> yeah. by the outsider's image and perception of Africa. And that is a sad thing. And it's unfortunate. We don't teach enough of our history. I was speaking with some Nigerian friends who were telling me that, in fact, at one time there was a debate in Nigeria about the benefits of teaching history because they thought it's not uh, productive. <laughs> they need to focus on uh, technology and science, and that is much more rewarding, and that's how you're going to develop Nigeria. And I said, you know, you're completely wrong because look at countries that have become successful in terms of challenging the West economically. Look at Japan. Japan industrialized late, embraced all the technology from the West, but never abandoned its core culture. You see? And that's yeah. why it's able to integrate what it thinks is beneficial to Japan while retaining Japanese culture, because that obviously is very important in anchoring their society. The same thing for, um, uh, for China, uh, the People's Republic of China. China retains its culture, even though China over the recent years has embraced market economics, but they embraced it, fitting it to the needs of their society without emulating or aping the West. So they don't have a lot of the other crises that we see in the Western countries. They maintain their culture, their tradition, their respect for family, um, communal types of living, but at the same time still were able to embrace their market system and grow into a global power. And just kick out the uh, most destructive elements of Western, Western, in fact, Western interference, Western meddling in their conduct. I, I remind people that in 1960, the per capita income of China was less than $100. It was about $90. At that time, Ghana's was almost $300. Think about that. Oh, that's almost what's the nice. difference? Exactly. China today is a global power because China uses its resources to benefit uh, the people of China. And we don't have that in Africa. Africa, we still uh, are dominated. We are integrated into the global system in a dependent and dominated role by the industrialized countries of the world. Traditionally, it had been the West, but yeah. now even China is using Africa's resources uh, to build up China. We can't challenge that unless we first condition our mind. Uh, we, we should stop imagining an Africa that is always dependent and always has to be assisted by the outside world. Yeah. You see? Yeah. And that comes with knowledge of your history, knowledge of the achievements that uh, Africa had. Africa had one the world's uh, first civilizations, you know? That's Africa true. Is the, the origin of man, but many of our people are not even aware of that. See? <laughs> Think about it. It's disappointing. It's dis and speaking about 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 culture, right? I think one particular person that will be really interested in, you know, like be uh, like like in the role that culture plays in liberation and transformation of of societies is actually Amilcar Cabral. Right. And yes. he spoke about yeah, the role that culture plays. And I think mm -hmm. he will be really excited, you know, with last year, you know, hearing that the 26 looted royal treasures were returned to Benin by France. Yes. And, and yeah. the, the uh, Benin president actually said, um, this is uh, our soul, Mr. President, saying that to Emmanuel Macron. So I think, yeah, it's really nice that understanding the role that culture plays in a society and not taking history for granted. I mean, as much as we want technology, we want to be advanced, you know, like become, you know, our countries becoming the, you know, like the first world countries, we still can't, you know, run away from who we are, who we have been, right? Because that plays an integral part. Unless otherwise it's like we are going to lose our identity. Absolutely. And without identity, you really can't achieve much because you start aping others. You see everything that Africa produces as negative. You see? You start yeah. in, in, internalizing what uh, Fanon said. You start 
uh, internalizing the inferiority concept. You see? Yeah. And once you do that, it means you are pretty much defeated. You're surrendered. You will not be able to imagine that you can ever challenge the countries that are quote unquote uh, more yeah. advanced than Africa. How is it possible for you to think that you are secondary to someone where number one, you have the history of being the origin of human being. Yeah. Having civilizations that flourished, uh, Ghana, Mali, Songhai, before even England existed. So that's the history. But then today, you have all the resources that the industrialized countries need to build up their economies. How can you be sitting on the resources and sitting on impoverishment at the same time? Something is not right. And part of that is because we don't appreciate ourselves enough as Africans. Because if we did, we would be able to work together collectively. That's How true. has it been that we've been talking about African unity since 1960, since 1963? Yeah. Formally, and up today, we have barely achieved anything. With unity, we would really increase our negotiating power. We would say, if you want our a copper, you pay this amount, but we also want technology in return. Why should you take the raw copper, the raw whatever mineral it is, yeah. as is, and pay us a minuscule amount and use that for your industries? We need some of the technology, so while we give you the resources, we're also building some industries right here in Africa. Had we done that for the last uh, 60 years, where do you think Africa would be today? Certainly, we would not be in the most impoverished condition of all the continents today. That's true. That's a travesty. That's, that, that, and then you know primarily that is because of bad leadership as well. I like to encourage young people to be activists, to demand yeah. that you, you are not being, having, having a inadequate or incompetent leadership is not natural. It's not a natural thing. Even historically, before the European intervention with colonialism, we had the history of bad, in, incompetent leaders being driven out, yeah, being removed from leadership <laughs> and replaced. So how is it that we uh, can be tolerant on leaders who don't, who do not, um, don't deliver on, on any of the promises? So I encourage people to be activists, to be demanding. You know? Yeah, yeah. And the youth, Africa is a young continent, as you know. If the youth collectively insist that this is what we deserve, this is what we must get, or you're out, mm -hmm. it will become a pattern. We need to see more of that <laughs> uh, happen in Africa. Instead of us seeing young Africans drowning, trying to cross the Mediterranean. Think about that. That is, to me, is the most, uh, uh, the clear indication and evidence of failure of leadership in Afghan countries. When our young people are forced uh, to try to cross the Mediterranean, to get mm. to Europe so they can clean the streets, they can clean the bathrooms, they can work in the kitchens, they can work at somebody's domestic, they can work in those farms in uh, Southern Europe, almost yeah. like slave-like conditions. That is appalling. We must not tolerate that. That must generate so much outrage that our young people go out to the streets and demand change. So I was listening to one of your podcasts and you were speaking about the, 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 the money that China is loaning Africa right now, right? And you Correct. said that, you know, if they are taking our resources, we should not only take money, right? Half of Absolutely. it should be money, half of it should be technology. Right? And I think that's Without a really a good idea. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And if we have that model, in fact, that model should be a part of an African Union, AU a covenant of doing business with an African country. And if every African country accepts that, so that any outside power cannot run to country A or country B or country C to try to play them off against one another, if we all accept that collectively, then we're in business. Because it means whichever African country you go to, they're going to have the same set of conditions. You won't be able to exploit Zambia because uh, Democratic Republic of Congo has a different uh, arrangement. Once more, 
DRC want, wants technology and, and, and money. Zambia only wants money. So you're mm. going to deal with Zambia. Yeah. You see? Yeah. Because you think you can get the advantage by dealing with Zambia. But if yeah. all of them have this uniform policy, then it would apply to the resources that Zambia has, DRC does not have. You see? Yeah. And the same and, and vice versa for the entire continent. You see? So yeah. now let's look at cobalt, for example. As you know, cobalt is a major component in the batteries that are going to power these electric vehicles. Yeah. So the price, the price has been jumping very rapidly and is going to continue jumping as demand for electric vehicle keeps expanding. It's going to be so difficult for DRC Congo to come up with a model that will benefit it if yeah. it does not have the support of the entire continent. So in a vital resource like this, this would be like the demand for uranium in the 1960s, when there was the big demand, they're all building their nuclear assets. Yeah. You know, now they have the nuclear assets. So while they're still demanded, it's not as compelling as cobalt is today for electric vehicles. So will Congo be able to withstand the pressure alone? I don't think so. But if Congo is speaking collectively with the African Union, that in order to access the cobalt, yeah. number one, Congo needs to have the technology to manufacture some of the electric vehicles right there in Congo. You see? Yeah. In addition to selling you the cobalt for money. Yes, money has some value, but technology transfer has much more value than the money because this breaks off the, the permanent dependency relationship that we currently have with the more advanced countries of the world. This is the thing that a lot of African leaders have been preaching about for quite some time. And even Sankara himself, when he was addressing yes. uh, the Organization of African Unity, he said, yes. he said that um, Africans should be able to produce what they consume, right? And he said Absolutely. that rather than exporting raw materials, we need to be able to export mm -hmm. finished goods, right? So that they buy the finished mm -hmm. goods and not just them taking raw materials and then we go back and buy from them again, right? And also mm -hmm. speaking about collectivity of the you know Africans being one and uniting, he also spoke about uh, the debts that Africa had, Africans had to pay to yes. colonialists, right? And yeah, yes. this was his speech in, 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 uh, in July 29, in uh, 1987, right? And he All said right. that we Africans need to stick together and declare that we are not going to pay the money, right? We are not going to All pay right. the money that they want us to pay. And he understood the fact that this was something that would definitely piss the West. And he said that if, if I am the only one who is against this, if it's only Thomas Sankara who is against this, right? He said, right. I am sure that I won't be back for the second meeting. All and right. it's insane year, because... Meeting. Next year's meeting, exactly. And it's weird because, and I don't think it's weird. I think it's what one would expect during such times because in the next month, he was actually assassinated. If Africa unites, then we are going to have a very strong continent because if we say no, it's no, right? You can't go to another country and, and exploit it, right? Because they're going to tell you Absolutely. yes. And, and, and that's when the whole idea of, you know, having um, an United States of Africa came into play and we had individuals Absolutely. like, like Kwame Nkrumah, who were pushing for it, but unfortunately, it never happened, right? Individuals so like right. Amar Gaddafi, all these individuals who were pushing for it, they ended up being assassinated. Correct. Well, uh, as uh, you may recall, uh, Sankara actually predicted it, as you pointed out. He said, I will not be here to attend next year's meeting. And that was July, October, he was dead. And uh, sadly, uh, not enough African presidents have the courage that Sankara had. Remember, he said they disappointed. In fact, they contributed to, uh, to his uh, assassination because they did not commit to support him. He said very clearly they cannot assassinate more than 50 presidents. He said it. So he was aware of it. And if you look at uh, the video, I think there's a video on YouTube, you'll see the African president, the others nodding, agreeing with him. Yeah. 
but they never committed. It's just easy to nod your agreement. Yeah, to just say you agree. Not to take any action. So yes, they killed him out. They killed him. And he understood the importance of breaking our dependency from the current relationship because it does not take uh, rocket science to realize that if the price of the commodity that I sell to the world, if the price is either diminishing in relative terms to the manufactured products that I, I buy, or in some cases, even diminishing in real terms. <laughs> yeah. And if this goes on on a yearly basis, what is going to happen? Impoverishment is going to increase, right? In fact, African countries are de-industrializing, meaning many of them in terms of the percentage of industry to economic production to GDP has diminished since Uhuru. What kind of scenario is that? Think about that. And their share as a consequence of the global trade has also diminished meaning we are getting less of the global economic pie. This is unsustainable. And as I said, that consequently results in us seeing our young people making those desperate voyages. Think about it. They see the images of other young people drowning and dying, right? Yeah. They know that. And yet they still take that voyage. They know that many are being intercepted, unfortunately, in some of our uh, North African countries, including in Libya, where many of them endure the worst uh, forms of abuse, uh, torture, sexual violence, killing, being uh, sold off in a modern type of uh, enslavement, and yet they still make that journey. I would rather our young people say, you know what, enough is enough. We are going to get together collectively and even stage an uprising and get rid of incompetent leadership that we have in our country. As a young person, if I was living in that era and I had the knowledge that I have now, that's certainly what I would be busy doing. I would not be busy plotting how to make that trek all the way, uh, even sometimes to the desert uh, to get to the Mediterranean coast, knowing the high death rate of uh, even children, uh, women, and then of course the young people, just to try to improve their lives. I would say no, the resources are right here on the motherland. What we need to do is to get enough people to say enough is enough. Uh, we keep demanding the type of leadership that Thomas Sankara was trying to demonstrate. And that is why Thomas Sankara, as you know, is popular throughout Africa. He's not seen as a product of Burkina Faso. He's seen as a product that belongs to the entire African continent, which means the uh, many people on the African continent who really aspire to the kind of uh, 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 leadership that Sankara was offering, but what he wanted to do with that leadership, which was to transform the country, to take power uh, from the top back to the grassroots so that people can really determine their destiny. We have a situation now in many African countries where even people, people are even getting kicked off their land. Think about that. You're kicked off the land because the regime wants to bring in, quote unquote, foreign investor. How are you supposed to eat? How are you supposed to survive? Think about that. These contradictions, we must teach our youth not to internalize it and see that as their own failure. No, they're not the ones who are failing. The leadership is the one that are failing them. So they need to develop the mindset that if a leadership is failing, the leadership must be removed. And that's that's amazing. I mean, and I think it's it's nice that you know you understand that if the leadership is is failing, then it has to be removed. And speaking about Thomas Sankara, I think 
I think it's so unfortunate that every time we have a great African leader, a leader who can do amazing things and transform the, the, the country around, they end up being assassinated, right? And even right. for him, what he did was actually giving power back to the people, right? Mm-hmm. There were no there were no railways. It's the people who built the railway stations, right? He didn't want Absolutely. to take loans, right? There were no schools. It's the it's the people who were building these schools, right? It's the people who were building what they wanted and even created a court by the people, right? In which the leaders were actually tried by the people, right? And yeah, and absolutely. it's so unfortunate that despite the fact that he gave power to the people, they still turned against him, right? And it's like while he's trying to make their lives better, at the end of the day, they, they I don't know what was wrong, but they also played a part in you know removing him, in assassinating him. And I think what with what he did in three years, like I think we for now would need our leaders to take more than even twenty years to try and accomplish half of what he did in the three years that Absolutely. he was in power. No, I agree with you. Uh, that's where you know they've always used their agents to eliminate uh, leaders who really want to work on behalf of the interests of the people. Look at uh, beginning with Patrice Lumumba. Patrice Lumumba in Congo. In Congo. You know, he used somebody that he himself had promoted and then had entrusted. And Mobutu. Mobutu, <laughs> Mobutu was Sekou. promoted by, by Lumumba, sadly. Many of Lumumba's own colleagues did not trust Mobutu and wanted Lumumba to get rid of Mobutu. Not eliminate him physically, but just, you know, remove him from uh, that uh, responsibility of being in charge of the army. But, uh, you know, they, they would have found another way anyway, because the West was determined uh, to continue controlling Congo's resources. So had it not been Mobutu, it likely would have been somebody else. It was very difficult for things to have played out in a different scenario. He might have even been eliminated much earlier mm-hmm. had it not been for the intervention of, of Kwame Nkrumah of Ghana. Kwame, yeah. Because Ghana sent, contributed many soldiers to the UN force, which was sent to try to stabilize the country, but which actually failed to support the legitimate elected government because Lumumba was the legitimately elected Elected. leader as prime minister. But they promoted uh, Kasavubu, who was the the, the president, not the executive president. Lumumba was the executive prime minister. But they promoted uh, Kasavubu, got him to dismiss Lumumba, knowing as soon as he did that, they would side with Kasavubu, they would give him all the support he needed. And that's exactly what happened. So Ghana, Nkrumah, was like a mentor to Lumumba, giving him advice on how mm. to negotiate these shark infested uh, waters. And uh, people like uh, Gamal Abdel Nasser of uh, Egypt also were supportive. Uh, Sekuture, Guinea, supported and uh, people like Modi Bokeita in Mali. But as you know, African countries were newly independent. So many of them did not have uh, built up armed forces. In fact, many of them still had European commanders Mm. of of their army, you know? And um, African countries were not able to come to the full support of of Patrice Lumumba. So they were able to use his so-called friend to eliminate him. Same thing in Ghana. Uh, The CIA was working with the senior officers in Ghana's military and police, and they plotted and they removed uh, Kwame Nkrumah. The same thing with Modi Bokeita. They promoted a coup d'etat against them. Sekoture survived many assassination attempts against them. So you see the pattern. So by the time they come and they use Blaise Kampoire for Thomas Sankara, Thomas his Sankara, friend, yeah. They, they had developed that model already uh, throughout Africa. So now you have a situation where many African leaders are reluctant to be brave 
to be like a Thomas Sankara because they know the consequences. You see? Yeah. But unfortunately, we can't accept that as the rationale. Then why are you in leadership? If you're saying I'm in leadership, but I'm not going to do ABC because I don't want to be removed like Thomas Sankara, then step aside. Let somebody who is willing to sacrifice be in leadership. And that somebody who is in leadership should work collectively with other African countries. Because if all of you pursue a similar po policy to empower the people of Africa, then it's very difficult for them to start eliminating all of you. It's impossible. It goes back to what Sankara said. They cannot assassinate more than 50 African leaders at the same time. But if only one or two are progressive, working on behalf of the African people, then certainly it's very easy to get rid of uh, those one or two. And that's the dilemma we face in Africa. We must break out of that uh, lockdown. We absolutely have to. And speaking about Kwame Nkrumah, of course, I mean, he died, he was assassinated in 1972, right? And he also understood well, what... Well, 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 um, as you know, that's not the official version of how he died, but... <laughs> <laughs> but what's, many, what's the official? But but the, the the official version is that he died of cancer, right? Oh, okay. But there are many who believe that he was actually poisoned. He was actually that, poisoned. Uh, as as you know, cancer can be introduced in many ways, right? I think so. The official is, but... the official version is that uh, Hugo Chavez died of cancer, but then there's many there are many who believe he was also uh, poisoned. You yeah. see. So yeah, but uh, there are many people up today yeah. who don't believe uh, Kuma uh, died naturally. So okay, I agree with you. Yeah, which is the same story with even Bob Marley, right? They say he died of cancer, but I think it's probably yeah, it's the same story. Absolutely. Too. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. There's a lot of people also believe the same thing with Bob Marley. Yeah, but Kuma, I advise anyone who's listening to our conversation, if you cannot buy. If you buy books and you think it's worth spending money to buy books, then one of the books you must buy is Neocolonialism, The Last Stage of Imperialism. Because not only does Nkrumah analyze the history and he makes the argument that since the West committed so many crimes against Africa just to access our resources, mm. why do you think they're not going to commit similar crimes just because now we are formally independent, when they will still have the same demand and the hunger for our resources. So what must we do? We have to create a United States of Africa because so that's the only way we can protect our resources. Regardless of any differences we may have politically, if we can't protect our resources, we will never be able to use our resources to build the African continent. And the book is so analytical, mm. but written in a very plain language. So he looks at East Africa. He says, look at the resources they have in East Africa. Look at the resources we have in West Africa. The ones they don't have, the ones we don't have, you know? Yeah. So we can build industries that don't cannibalize each other. So we allow East Africa to specialize in certain types of manufacturing and they will have the entire African market for those products. We will have West Africa focus on certain types of manufacturing that is not being duplicated in East Africa, so that West Africa for those particular products will have the entire African market. And that is how we will build up our domestic industry. In the book, it's not just a book, it's a blueprint for African independence and African economic development. That's why I strongly recommend it. And let me give listeners another incentive. If you're not yet sure whether you want to purchase this book, go on um, a Google and search for the introduction. Put introduction to neocolonialism, the last stage of imperialism, and then put PDF and a PDF version will pop up, not of the entire book, 
part of the introduction. Oh, the introduction. The introduction is amazing. After you read the introduction, and if you still don't buy that book, then I think you have a problem. <laughs> <laughs> yes so yeah. if yeah so if anyone is listening please go ahead and take a look at the book neocolonialism the last stage of imperialism written Absolutely. by Kwame Nkrumah himself and i think yeah. we are we are we are we are so fortunate that we still have the opportunity to read what this man was thinking right because yes. if you speak about the pioneers in the african continent of having you know the united states of africa you can't leave him out because he was among the individuals who played a huge role in that right and also speaking about him saying that without uniting we cannot survive i mean you also say that you know we won't be able to survive their their appetite for our resources and they will use one of us to undermine the other right and i think yes. it's exactly what they have been doing right and even mm -hmm. using military intervention right and we have seen yes. Yeah, a lot is happening right now. I think it's in Mali, if I'm not mistaken, right? Right. Well, we have the friends in there, right? So I think, yeah, I think it's good that, you know, we we still have the opportunity to be able to read what this man was thinking. And yeah, if you're listening to this podcast, you definitely have to go and check the book Neocolonialism, the last stage of imperialism published in 1965 by right. Kwame Nkrumah himself. <laughs> That's not, and, and Nkrumah paid a price for that, by the way. The United States wrote an official protest. Think about that. Official government protest of the United States to the government of Ghana because of that book. Wow. I mean, I, I don't think anyone needs any other incentive to go and read that book. Yeah. And withdrew $25 million in assistance that had already been committed to Ghana. To Ghana. So I, I want somebody to look up what is the value of $25 million today, uh, $25 million in 1965, what is the value today? Right. And that gives you an indication of how substantial that amount of assistance was. That was withdrawn because of Kuruma's book. <laughs> <laughs> so that's why I say this is a blueprint for African liberation and for African development. I'm so sad that even many African progressives are not aware of this book. This book should be uh, reprinted in Africa for the African market, you see, to make it much more accessible for people in Africa. Because not mm -hmm. everybody can access Amazon. Yeah, and that's true. From Amazon, you see? That's true, that's we true. Need, we need African publishers. If you're publishing books in Africa, why would you not want to publish this kind of book, which would benefit uh, so many people on the African continent, you know? Yeah. And speaking about the books that we have to be reading in school, I don't know why we are not reading his book in school, right? So the, uni the university that I go to, we usually have seminar readings, right? And we usually read articles and, and, and stuff. And it's so unfortunate that we were not able to read at least some few extracts from his book. Right. And, and th that goes to show how much we don't value our own individuals. Right. We'll go outside and look for writings from other people. And yet we have some of the greatest writers and thinkers in the African continent. But we still can't yeah. have conversations with them. We still can't read what no, they have no, been no, doing. No, no. That's the problem. The problem is the, the intellectual mental brainwashing. I watched a documentary. And unfortunately, I don't remember... The, the title now. It's about uh, Professor Anta Job. And I saw it a couple of years ago. And of course, as you know, Anta Job was one of the greatest scientists who ever lived. Senegalese. Uh, one of his uh, seminal books that I highly recommend is The African Origin of Civilization. So there are some books that must be on our curriculum. African Origin of Civilization by Anta Job. And of course, Nkrumah's uh, yeah. uh, Neocolonialism, the, the, last the last stage of imperialism. Uh, Walter Rodney's How Europe Underdeveloped Africa. And these are all books, by the way, that I use in my classes right here in the United States. But let me speak briefly on uh, Anta Job. Anta Job, as you know, uh, was very important in establishing that the ancient people of Kemet 
aka Egypt, were Africans, right? Because there'd always been that debate. You have the Hollywood, Hollywood version of Egypt, <laughs> where Egyptians are Europeanized, and that's the global image of Egypt, right? Yeah. So Anta Job got samples uh, from the mummies of ancient Egyptian, and he tested it in his laboratory doing radiocarbon testing uh, for the aging, but also for the melanin content. And the melanin content was consistent with melanin content of people who are Africans, you see? Yeah. So he established that. And then he went to the Egyptian authorities of antiquity and asked them for small samples of, of, uh, for, of from uh, the mummies of the Egyptian royals, you see? Yeah. And they refused. <laughs> they refused because even the people who controlled the antiquities in Egypt would rather maintain that Hollywood version of Egypt as a Europeanized mm. um, Egypt. Because as you know, the people that are now referred to as Egyptians uh, are actually relatively very recent arrivals on the African uh, continent. As you continent. know, it was after the uh, Islamic conquest of, uh, of, 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 of Egypt. And in relative terms, this is very recent. We're talking in the years uh, 600, 700, whereas Egypt had existed 3,500 years before the Christian era, you see? Yeah. So I saw in that documentary where Anta Job was speaking with some Senegalese students, right? Yeah. In the university in Senegal. And the student, one student, when it came to question and answer, said, Professor, <clears throat> if what you are saying and teaching is true, why aren't the professors in European countries also accepting it? <laughs> Can you imagine? <laughs> this is an African student asking a very eminent African professor that basically saying it, can't be, it cannot be true that the Europeans have not accepted it. And this, I, but I like Anthony Job's response. This is what he said. He said so, okay, no, you, you are in a university here, uh, and the presumption is that you are probably you're, you're intelligent. I'm sure you, you agree you're intelligent, right? Yes. So now, you, an intelligent student, one day, should you discover something or come up with this, you know, unique uh, knowledge? Are you going to believe in what you came up with or are you going to wait until a European tells you, oh, this is This is knowledge. right. Then the student was silent and realized how nonsensical his question to Professor Job is. But I bring this up to say that this is part of the colonial mental brainwashing that uh, people suffer from. I have students right here in the United States who went to high school in countries like Senegal, you know, Mali, mm. and now they're studying in the United States or their parents in the United States. And they asked me, Professor, why am I learning this type of history for the first time here in the United States? Why did I not learn this in Senegal? Why did I not learn this in Mali? And this to me is very, very sad when I hear this, but it shows you the challenge that we have because you are what you are. And what do I mean by that? It means the Africa that we have is reflective of the Africans that we produce, the people that we produce from our schools and our colleges, right? Yeah. They shape who we are, they shape what the countries are, they shape what the continent is. So education is the most critical thing. Even be before development, before development, 
you need to have educated mind to be oriented toward a certain type of development. If you have us just praise worshiping, praising the West, celebrating yeah. the West, you know, saying, oh, these are the gods of the world, right? We are, <laughs> then, then how can you be surprised that we are not only are we not going anywhere, we seem to be going backwards, backwards. in many respects, you know? Yeah. I think it's time, it's time, and, and also Diopo's called world's foremost African thinker. I mean, and it's quite interesting because here's the thing, right? In as much as, you know, we try and read African history, like individuals like Diop are not, they're not famous. They're not people that we know, right? Well, mm -hmm. in real sense, these are the people that we should study extensively, right? Because they're, they're mm -hmm. it's, I mean, I don't know. Okay, I know that, you know, Africans don't have the culture of reading, right? But at least, you know, for students, right? Those going to, even secondary school, like these are some of the things that we should start learning in secondary school, right? And not wait to kind of like, you know, do our own research until we realize these individuals. And I think it's time that, you know, Africa increases power in storytelling and brings individuals such as Diop to, to the surface, right? So that people can know about them. People can read books that were written by these individuals because they're some of the smartest people to ever walk the planet. And I believe that Africa has some of the greatest and smartest individuals in the world. Absolutely, without a doubt, I do believe in that, right? But it's quite unfortunate that these are the individuals who at the end of the day end up going to countries such as the US, right? Because that's where right. they have opportunities and we don't have opportunities in our continent. And it's the right. same thing which also applies to entrepreneurs, right? Because I also have conversations with entrepreneurs and they usually tell me, right? You know, I have a great idea. I've started implementing my idea. It has it has impact. And here I am in my country, which doesn't even want to support me, right? And yet I have, you know, letters from the US, right, calling me to go and work with them in their country, right? So right. I think it's quite a disappointment that we still don't appreciate some of the smartest people that we have in the continent and individuals who can help us transform our lives and, you know, make us as powerful as we possibly can. Because I believe Africa has the potential to be a very powerful continent in the world. Oh, without a doubt. I have no doubt that it will happen. You know, the only problem is the longer we delay the process, the more, yes, our people will continue to endure the suffering. But it will happen because, uh, so you mentioned, for example, the coup in Mali. And, you know, I'm generally very critical of coups d'etat. I call them useless coups unless it's the kind of transformative takeover under Thomas Sankara, you know? Yeah. So I, I support takeovers of that nature. So in Mali, I was very critical of the coup, you know, you know the guy, you know, came there, you know, took over power, and then he sort of put in like a half civilian, half military uh, administration. Then uh, about uh, a year later, yeah, actually less than a year later, he stopped the pretense, you know, kicked out <laughs> the civilian part, you know, took power again for himself. Um, so I've been very critical. But now I've been speaking with a lot of uh, my Malian friends and colleagues, and they're arguing that this coup could actually be transformative. Because number one, now he's trying to get rid of the French domination of Mali. And recently, even expelled the French, French ambassador. Ambassador, which, you know, is really, and I'd never heard of an African country doing something like that, right? Yeah. Uh, kicking out the ambassador from the former colonial master country. And the key question was this, France has deployed thousands of troops in Mali for more than a decade now. They always had a presence, but increased the numbers. And they're saying they're fighting against the, you know, they're saying Islamist, very radical Islamist, that's what they say. And yet, they've not been able to succeed in pushing them out for more than 10 years, right? And in the zone where they have deployed, Malian troops are not even allowed to go there. You see? In so your own country. Words, that, 
is in their own country. So the question arose, why has it taken you so long? And as you know, Central African Republic also had problems with insurgency. But then they invited the support of uh, Russians. And they were able to push back the insurgency in Central African Republic. So then the, 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 the military in Mali said, you know what, the French are not interested in pushing out the insurgency because if we eliminate the insurgency, there's no need for the French deployment of the thousands of troops in our country. And, and that also, is what, go ahead. And it also reduces their influence in the country. Absolutely, of course. And that is the key thing. It, it, reduces, it, it, it reduces, eliminates the influence. And they've now invited Russians to come and help them fight the insurgency. And they want to phase out uh, the French deployment. And now they actually have, and I can tell by the uh, social media postings, I can tell by some of the demonstrations that have occurred, they seem to be gaining the support of the masses now because of this approach toward the French. So is this an indication that this could end up being a transformative takeover, even progressive? Many of my Malian friends seem to think so. Uh, my own argument is that, okay, it may be trending in the right direction, but it's too soon because a lot of these, uh, if it's a reactionary military officer, you know, they could use your support right now to consolidate themselves. And then when the time comes for them down the line to, uh, to go, you know, yeah. they might not want to go. But they're asking, many of them are saying, give us the benefit of the doubt. And one of them gave me this analogy. So listen, if you are drowning and somebody throws you a rope, you know, you're, you're not going to ask about their orientation so much. You take the rope and then once you are on solid ground, then you deal with the situation. So that's, they say that's where they are right now. So maybe I will be a bit less, I will be less critical for the time being. How's that? Mm. Of, 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 of the coup in Mali. <laughs> yeah, and, and I really hope that Asimi Goeta is able to, you know, uh, like he's able to prove them wrong, right? Because yeah. the problem usually is when, before they come into power, right, these leaders, they usually sweet talk the people. Right. And yes. promise them a lot of things. But the moment they get into power, they completely change because they usually say, yes. give the man power and you'll know his true nature. Yes, absolutely. Um, you talked about books. And that even young people, book, reading books, not such a big thing for them now. Right. Absolutely. Everybody just wants the sound bites and to read a few sentences on social media. And Instagram, and that's their and news. Instagram, right. So what I've, I'm trying to do now is, you know, people like images, like graphics, right? Absolutely. So I've just, because I think sometimes you have to speak in a language that people understand. Otherwise, you may have all the information, but if you don't make it accessible, then what is the use, right? That's true. So it becomes that is, useless. It becomes useless. So I've just finished a graphic book about the Battle of Adwa, which was the great Ethiopian victory on March 1, 1896, when the Ethiopian Empress Taitu and Emperor Merelik yeah. and many of the other generals defeated an invading Italian imperial army. And that is why Ethiopia was the only African country not to be colonized. Not to be colonized, yeah. Absolutely. The commander of the army, General Oreste Baratieri, had promised that he would turn back, return to Rome with the emperor in a cage so he could be displayed in the zoo. <laughs> And they all celebrated in Rome. They gave him a, a, a big send off, you know? Yeah. And then he comes with four other generals. So you have five generals, right? Yeah. You have, you have more than 26 other senior officers, right? Yeah. And then you have 
an army of 17,000 that includes Italian soldiers and soldiers from Eritrea, because Eritrea had already been colonized by Italy. So they forced you know, Africans from Eritrea to fight against the African brothers. And then they fought that battle and it lasted no more than six hours, right? <laughs> and the Ethiopians killed two of the Italian generals. They captured one general. Two generals, including Baratieri, fled the scene of the battle when they realized that uh, they were being annihilated. They killed almost 3,000 Italian soldiers. They captured uh, almost another 3,000 and marched them all the way to Addis Ababa and put them to work. So the tables were turned. Now you have Africans captured Europeans and supervising them on how to help build the capital city of Addis Ababa. And then a year later, they made Italy pay many millions of, uh, of dollars before they released the prisoner. This, and uh, what was unique was that the Empress herself was in command of 6,000 soldiers, 6,000 men being commanded by the, the, uh, the Empress, fighting alongside her husband, the Emperor. This is a great story. It's a great story that most Africans are not even aware of, right? Absolutely. So this yeah. is where we as Africans need to step in and tell these kind of stories that not all Africans who are defeated by the colonial aggression, the Europeans would want us to have that impression. That is why they are not going to be the ones who tell the story of Adwa. That is the story that we must tell. So I want to make it accessible. And that's why I'm doing it as a graphic book. I have the narration, but also I have graphic images of the battle itself, of the empress, of the emperor, of ordinary Ethiopians who mobilized and joined to defend the motherland. And so I'm hoping these are the type of books that we can produce to get the younger generation once again interested in reading. Because without reading, it's very difficult. <laughs> to become a productive citizen, you know. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and when the book is available, please do share it with me and I'll definitely share it with the people in the, in the link in the description in the video when you upload it later. Oh, absolutely, without a doubt. I hope you would also want us to discuss it again on your show. Definitely, once definitely. Once yeah. the book is out, I'll go through it, I'll read it, and then I'll definitely want to have a conversation with you again because we, I mean, there is no way that we can avoid having an educated nation if we want right. to succeed, right? And that right. is why, like most most of the successful African leaders who ended up being assassinated were individuals who were also pushing for education. I mean, they were pushing for literacy rates to increase. Absolutely. And it's what, even Sankara. Even exactly. Sankara. Yeah. Sankara yeah. was not your typical soldier who just does the military training and all that. Sankara read history, read economics. Marxism. Lenin. He read philosophy, of course. Think about that. Our only soldier would not <laughs> be exposed. But, but then you know why it happened partly? Yeah. Because a professor who was providing tutorship, and I like this, that they have a system like that. We need to have this in all African countries, where professors come and they tutor uh, people, uh, officers, young rising officers in the, in the army, right? Yes. But this particular professor, he would always select the brightest student for additional tutorship at his private residence. So Sankara was amongst that group selected by the professor to come for additional education. Because obviously, this was even before the country became independent. And the French colonial authorities and the neo-colonial authorities, even after the French were gone, would not like you to be teaching history which is contrarian to what the colonialists want to teach, right? Exactly. Economics, to what is in their books. Challenge the capitalist system. So this professor realized Sankara's talent and picked him out for additional education. And that is why he became this very progressive and very productive 
uh, leader, even though his life was sadly cut down too short. You know, yeah. so it goes back to the point you just made. Yeah, there's just no way to get around education and a certain type of education. It can't just be education that produces European Africans, you know. Mm. And that's true. And and here's the thing, and why I appreciate learning so much, right? I, I like learning every single day, every single day, right? And when you spoke about, you know, Thomas Sankara being an educated and, and learned person, right? This is why we see that he did things that people are thinking about doing them today, right? Mm-hmm. It, for example, global warming, right? This is the theme that Think people haven't that. been speaking about for a very long time, right? And when he was in power, he planted like what? Almost 10 million trees. And this, we are speaking Absolutely. about 1986, 1987, right? Absolutely. And, and also things such as women empowerment, right? Mm-hmm. When Sankara came in, he wanted women to have jobs, right? He wanted mm-hmm. them to be able to join the army, right? Something that was really, it, I right. mean, it, you would hardly see They're during not, such not years. Not jobs, but real jobs, right? Absolutely, real jobs. Mm-hmm. And he even had the day, I think it was on Wednesdays, when women would stay in the house and then men would have to do the chores in the house so that they understand, you know, the market prices and how things right. really operate inside uh-huh. the house, right? I think it was on International <laughs> Women's Day, right? Yeah, absolutely, on International Women's Day. So I think there, is, there, is, there is a huge advantage when we have leaders who are individuals who like to learn every single day. Right. Unless otherwise, the world will keep on evolving and they can't even think ahead of their time right given the fact that right. we are already behind it's like we need to have leaders who think for the next 10 15 18 years down the line Absolutely. and then seeing what they can do to push that as soon as possible right right vaccine vaccine sankara vaccinated almost 2.5 million people right Absolutely. and here we are today when when the pandemic hit uh, not only that have... not only that you must add that he was also a big uh, proponent of exercise Absolutely. Exercising. He was yes, exercising remember, himself. He yeah. played it exactly. He played Can football. Imagine when a president is playing football <laughs> or leading people cycling, leading people jogging, it becomes like a national pastime, you see? And it's something that you hardly see in African countries, right? Nations pushing people to exercise. And su- because he understood, you know, like what it takes for you to have a successful yes. nation. Like your people need to be held, they need to be educated, exactly. right? And it's so unfortunate that we are not seeing these things nowadays. Yeah, but you know what? We have, uh, fortunately, we have platforms such as this, right? Yeah. I have young people contacted me from Uganda asking me to organize, you know, lectures and teach them some of the things that I teach uh, right here in John Jay in the United States. So that is a good sign. The thirst for knowledge is out there. And if our colleges are not providing the type of empowering knowledge that young people need, we need to create many more of the kind of platform that you have, that we're having this discussion on, you know? Yeah. I, you know, would not mind coming back at another future date and just presenting a summary of some critical aspects of African history. You see? Yeah, that would be really I great. Present that. Yes. And then we can cut it off. We can discuss it a little bit. Exactly. Present. And it's something we can even condense in one hour and, 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 and still provide so much information. You see? Let's maximize uh, the, the use of social media platform. Yeah, let's not surrender and say, oh, because uh, we have uh, incompetent leadership in some African countries, therefore we must surrender. That's not an option for our people. You know, in the in the in the in the bad old days when there was only one radio station, right? Or one TV station, and the government controlled that so that they could control the narrative. Those days are gone. Right? That's true. So now it's up to us to be very creative and step in to fill the vacuum, whatever a vacuum exists. There's no excuse for an African who has come of reading age and considers herself or himself to be knowledgeable, knowledgeable, not to know who Thomas Sankara is, not to know who Kwame Nkrumah is, not to know who Walter Rodney is, not to know who Empress Ataitu is. There's so much that Patrice we can teach people. Patrice Lumumba, um, Amilcar uh, Cabra. Uh, Amilcar Cabral, Julius Nyerere. You know? Exactly, Julius fact, Nyerere. I find that uh, 
uh, he is very appreciated uh, here in, in knowledgeable circles, progressive communities right here in the United States, you know? So let's maximize the opportunity that social media offers to us to really, really educate our people and empower them. Absolutely. I'll be more than happy to welcome you over for, for a couple of more episodes because we have a lot to talk about. If African people cannot go ahead and read, right? If they cannot uh, go ahead and get hard stuff and try and distill themselves, then at least we know that if we are to speak about it, right, we are not brushing it off. We are not sugarcoating, right? We are speaking Absolutely. straight facts, right? Because that is what the Absolutely. media does. That's what the mainstream media does. But at least now we have the opportunity to, to speak out the truth, right? And not sugarcoat anything. Right. And, and sometimes when we do that, you inspire others. You don't know how many people who may listen to our conversation today who could be inspired, who could say, okay, let me find out more about, uh, about uh, Kwame Krumah's book. And Sankara, find out also about his book. Sankara Speaks is a collection Sankara of speaks. speeches. Yeah, there's a collection of speeches, and his speeches are brilliant. You know, when uh, he came to address the UN General Assembly, uh, the US Embassy, in Burkina Faso had uh, indicated they would arrange for him to visit the White House, but they wanted to read his speech in advance. And he said, no, <laughs> I can't let you read my speech that I'm going to make. So the offer to invite him to the White House was withdrawn. So after he spoke at the UN, he went to Harlem and he said, Harlem is my White House, you see? So I would like people to read those type of speeches yeah. by Sankara. And it's in the collection, of the, the book is called Sankara Speaks, and it has this collection on speak, uh, uh, speeches on African unity, African economics, women's rights, uh, youth, uh, youth empowerment, youth empowerment. And so many other speeches. You know? <laughs> Exactly. I mean, to be honest, I mean, he's someone that everyone needs to read. And so what I also realized, right, because I'm also a curious person and I've always been curious on the on the individuals who have been assassinated in the African continent. Right. So unless you're pissing off, you know, the West, you, yeah. they cannot assassinate you. Right. So the moment someone is assassinated, then, you know, they have done something really great because they have pissed off the great powers that we have in the world. Absolutely. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and in, in a line to that, I've actually started creating documentaries for individuals who have been assassinated in the African continent, right? So in as much as, you know, I research a lot, I think this is also a segment that we can have where we speak about African leaders who were assassinated because oh, these course. are the individuals who had amazing ideas to transform the African mm -hmm. continent, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And also speaking mm -hmm. about, about learning, right? Speaking about learning, right now you'll hardly find individuals or young people who know the challenges that we'll be facing with China in the next 10, 20 years down the line, right? right. So we get, dead, we, we get loans from China, right? We get loans mm -hmm. from China, but then we don't understand the implications that the, 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 the loans have when it comes to the right. fact that we failed to repay them, right? We have seen, right. I, think it was the, I think it was last year, at the end of last year, there are rumors going around that, uh, that the only international airport in Uganda was going to be confiscated by the Chinese, right? And, right. and what is interesting, the statement that they gave, they didn't say that we are not going to confiscate any airport at all. Right. right. They just said right. we have not confiscated it. Right. We have not taken right, it, right. which means there's probably high opportunity. I mean, high chances down the line that they might be able to do that. Right. And the disappointing right. fact is that most of the African countries that have been taking loan from the Chinese, they have actually been putting some of the key resources in stake. Right. Like right. speak about airports, speak about oil, speak about uh, Mombasa, Mombasa port in Kenya. Right. right. And mm -hmm. and leaders such as Magufuli, you can argue about his leadership style, but he's right. among the leaders who said no to getting loans from outside. Right? right. When he was in power, we didn't get loans from any country and we survived. Right. Nobody was right. dying of hunger. Right. And right. I think right. it's a challenge that we keep on taking more loans. And to be honest, it's not like these loans are actually uh, utilized effectively. Right. We still don't right. see a lot of changes. And down the line, I don't think we'll have any influence in the world because let's assume what is happening right now with Russia and Ukraine. Right. right. Well, we have some African countries who choose not to vote. But then if it was like 20 years later and then China has a crisis with another country, 
with the amount of money that they have invested in the continent, with the amount of influence right. that they will have in the continent, I don't think we'll have a say in it. I don't think we'll have voice at all. Like, I think without, with our, with our 25% seat in the UN, I don't think we'll have any influence because they'll be the ones who actually have a say in what we are saying. Right. And yeah, that's a very good point. And that also, of course, says that that means we will be under the control totally of uh, by outside uh, uh, forces. On the one hand, you would have China leveraging the loans. On the other hand, for the last 60 years, we've had also the IMF and World Bank leveraging uh, the loans to African countries. And that is why, in fact, um, the late uh, president of Tanzania was always opposed to any deal with the IMF and in fact, the uh, Tanzania only had a deal with the IMF after his term in office had expired. He was op totally opposed. I'm not sure whether the first deal was while he was still alive or after he had passed on, but certainly not while he was president because yeah. that's one of the things that he feared. And in any case, so uh, IMF and World Bank, they've both been dealing with African countries for 60 years now. They cannot point one example of a success story. Not you know? at all. Not, Not at all. Anywhere on the continent. So what is their purpose then? They've only succeeded in maintaining the dependency relationship that Africa has with, uh, with industrialized countries. Because they tell you, even if they give you money, Number one, they say cut down social services, right? Cut down education, cut down healthcare, cut down everything that the people actually need, <laughs> that human beings need to improve their quality of life. They say cut down all of that. And then they say, okay, focus on agricultural production. Producing right? raw, raw materials. So, in other words, the IMF, World Bank, they've become the uh, modern weapons of colonialism, you know, in Africa. And of course, as you point out, these loans from China risk uh, repeating, replicating the same model. And as we said in the beginning of the show, any no loan that does not allow you uh, to use your own uh, raw materials to build industries domestically, then there's no difference between that and the IMF World Bank uh, type of loan. And uh, the late economist Samir Amin spoke a lot about that as well. He was also a big advocate of making sure that there's technology transfer in exchange for uh, resources, uh, raw resources. Uh, resources, you know. So I, I agree with you totally. That is um, increasingly what you're going to be saying. And in the case of the Ugandan example that you gave. So the country has a board, and I don't know what the entity is called, but the members of that body decide on which of Uganda's uh, debt needs to be paid. Whenever Uganda generates some money, they decide, okay, this amount is going to go to paying off this debt, this debt, this debt. So, on that board, China has a member sitting on that board. So, <laughs> and that is why people were talking about the airport because uh, the, 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 the Chinese member on the board is going to prioritize that the money that is becoming available for Uganda to spend, a portion of that must go to repaying China's debt. And that's what initiated that whole debate about China now controlling the airport. That's how it started. And believe me, the Chinese member of the board is not sitting on that board for no reason, right? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> They're smart enough for that. Yes, yes. Yeah, and, and I can see here, so from 2000 to 2018, we have a total of 148 billion 
that has been invested in the African continent by the Chinese. And they're saying mostly in large, I mean, in, in mostly for large scale infrastructure projects, right? However, right. if you are to go to any infrastructure project that is being carried out, right, under the money that China has loaned to Africa, I think 80 to 90% of the workers will be the Chinese. Right. right? So in as much as they're giving us loan, they're giving us money, it's still not really our money, right? Because if they are giving money and we are creating our own infrastructures, then at least let's us give jobs to people, right? Let's us try and, right. and, and you know, improve their standard of living. But if we are getting the money and it's still the Chinese that are coming to build these infrastructures, I mean, we can't even trust the engineers that we have made in our own countries. Right. That's the other part of the tragedy. But to me, even a bigger tragedy is this. All right. So you have this remarkable infrastructure. You have these splendid roads, uh, bridges, you know, tolls, airports to ship products, right? And what are these products you're shipping? They're still the same products that the European colonials were shipping. In the 1960s, As 1950s. You know, even, even much earlier. <laughs> exactly. After the colonial, <laughs> right? Yeah. They built, what did they do? They built roads, they built railways. And where did they build them to? They built it to the location. Strategic of locations. The minerals, the mines. So it went to the mines, it extracted, and it took the products out. So my problem is, I would rather you have them build factories all over in an African country and let the roads that exist be improved to an extent. Now you're exporting value added products that is earning you more money. So it means you are now able to pay off the loans and to invest some of the money in your domestic economy. Because now you are you're exporting products that have more value to the international market. Number two, you're creating high-skilled jobs. Because when you create manufacturing, that takes your know, level of training. So people are becoming skilled workers. And skilled workers are paid a lot more than unskilled workers. You know, so I don't have so much a problem with the loan and the magnitude of the loan. Yeah. My biggest problem is the loan has not been deployed to productive ends. Had it been deployed to uh, producing manufactured products using, uh, let's take Zambia as an example, using Zambia's copper, manufactured products based on copper. Now you're creating high skilled jobs in Zambia. You're creating a market for the products in other East and Southern African countries, you know, and duplicate that model wherever China has been lending money, doing the same thing for domestic industry in these individual countries. That's how you become transformative. And China can do that, but China will not do that unless that is the demand of African countries. Because great for China to give you hundreds of millions of dollars and get the raw materials in return, you know? Why should China be the one to offer you technology if you're not demanding for it? <laughs> you're not the speaking. The not work like that, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's interesting because we, we, have, we have minerals for, you know, all the technological uh, advancements that we, we, we want, right? Like we have, yeah. got, we have got the resources. I think it's, it's the right time for us to start, uh, you know, reaching out to China and saying, hey, if you are giving us the loans, you know, we want probably some of it. In, oh, okay. Yeah. Or if we are selling you uh, the, the raw materials that we have, in exchange, give us money and, you know, part of it should be in technology, right? And, and yeah. we have the opportunity to kind of like, uh, to kind of get some of the technology that they have developed, right? Because we have the negotiating power. Right now, we yeah. do have it, right? And I think before we, we lose potential. it. We have the potential but we need to put it together. Then we will have the negotiating power. Absolutely. We have, uh, yes, we have the potential. That's really nice. And, so, and so countries that have a lot of minerals, 
South Africa, right? Yes. All African countries have minerals, but some yeah. have a higher concentration. So South Africa, Zambia, Congo, DR Congo, Nigeria, you know? Yeah. There's six or seven countries that need to come together and be on the same page. You see? Yeah. So even though it's a handful of countries, they would take a large share of these resources that are needed, right? Yeah. So if they are speaking the same language and they're not undermining each other, you see, now China has to deal with us because we are speaking with one voice. Now the UK, now France, now Germany, now the US all have to deal with us with one voice, one system, one pattern, you see? Yeah. And this is what we are asking. Before we had been asking for this, now this is what we want today. And we're all on the same page. All seven presidents sitting with you today are on the same page. Exactly. That's Sit down. Kind of model, you know. And it's for anything. When students in our school are making demands, what do students do to maximize their success? They come together and speak with one voice. We've organized into a student union. We organize a protest. It could be initiated by one individual, but that individual is going to get numbers around her or him and then go make their demands. And then the authorities will realize, oh, they're on the same page. We have to maintain that demand. It's that simple. So in running the affairs of a state, we need to have that kind of approach when we go to the, you know, the principals or the headmasters, you know, and the headmasters in this case are the industrialized countries, you know. So I, I think, yeah, in as much as, you know, we would like, you know, to have the seven presidents sitting on the table with, you know, either, either China or USA, you know, or either the UK, right, and saying, okay, you want our minerals, here are the terms that we have mm -hmm. as the seven countries, right? Without you accepting these terms, you're not going to get minerals from any country. Right. And, and the thing is, like, a lot of technology in Western countries depend on the resources that the African continent has. Right? Mm -hmm. And in as much as it was easy for the African countries to unite during independence in the 1960s, when most of the countries in Africa got their independence, right, right. now it's a bit complex. It's a bit complicated, right? But if right. we can start thinking of even just start working in terms of regional integrations, right? Of course, we have like, yeah. you know, like the ECOWAS, we have the EAC, we have mm -hmm. the SADC, right? And I think it's high right. time for us to start really strengthening the bonds within the regional blocks and trying to I see agree. how we can probably move forward and, you know, now unite the regional blocks right because that would make Absolutely. us really strong and and one of the steps is that i think the past few months i don't know when kiswahili was made an official language in the au right and That's i think good. that is just one of the steps to get us where we want to go it might not be today the next five or ten years down the line but these right. are some of the small steps that we can start making because in all honesty most most national languages in African countries are either English, Swahili, no English, Portuguese, or French, mm -hmm. right? And these right. are not our languages, right? These are mm -hmm. languages that we inherited. And Nyerere right. had a good saying, which I really like. He said, if you want to speak to a man's, I think he said, if you want to speak to a man's um, brain, speak, speak with him his second language. And then he said, if you want to speak to a man's heart, speak with him in, in the mother tongue, right? The, the, his first language, right? And I think it's good that, because also Swahili is a combination of African languages, Bantu, right? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think it's nice that we have started making these crucial, import, crucial changes. And what right. is quite surprising mm -hmm. is that it took us all this while for us to be able yeah. to say, okay, hey, here is, we can use now a language that is used with over 100 million African people and make it an official language in the African Union. I, I think these are some of the things right. that we should have done earlier, but at least... Yeah, without a doubt. Yeah, but at without least we have... Exactly. And I think at least we have started, you know, going in the right direction and making some of yeah. these changes that would really push up in, push us into having a, a united, a truly united African state. Right. No, I, I like everything you said. I think <clears throat> now in terms of uh, independence, as you know, the grassroots people, the ordinary Africans, were the ones that exerted the pressure for independence. 
Um, if you look at Ghana's example, when Nkrumah, after he finished his education in the United States, he went to Lincoln University and then he went to the University of Pennsylvania. And then from there he went to London. And when he was still in London, the United Gold Coast Convention, the party called him to come back home to become the Secretary General of the party. And that party was the party of the elite, the educated, yes, the lawyers, the doctors, the accountants, whose parents had, um, and that was one of the interesting and unique things in Ghana. Unlike in Kenya, where the Europeans kicked Africans off the land and seized the land, in Ghana, they did not have as big of a European presence, and they did not kick Africans off the land, right? Yeah. So the producers of cocoa were able, even though they were cheated massively, you know, got maybe 20% or even less of the value of their product, they still got some relative substantial income. So they were able to send their children to school. Many of them went, you know, even to England, other places to study. And that's how they developed this elite. And the elite were asking for the Europeans to open the door, right? Stop this yeah. overt discrimination so they could become part of the government elite, right? Yeah. Uh, and Krumah saw that, he said, no, this is not enough. We need to be talking independence now. So I realized that this, you know, this is the part of the high end elite. This is not really what is for me. So he yeah. stepped aside. Don't and that's how you party. His own party, the convention, you know, of the people's party, right? Yeah. And that became the part of the master. So he started, instead of going to address elite gatherings, now he went to these huge mass rallies and really Peasants. educated the people about the power that they had collectively. And when the British saw those overwhelming numbers, you know, they tried to arrest him. In fact, he was behind bars when his party won the election and they had to release him to form the first internal self-government. So I say all this to suggest that we need to mobilize our masters again to achieve Africa's second Uhuru. And the second Uhuru is going to be a Uhuru that demands good leadership and a Uhuru that demands that Africa's wealth is used to generate wealth in Africa, not for the outside world. So the challenge is up to us to find creative ways to communicate this to ordinary people and to get them up to start showing up to these mass rallies once again and put the pressure on the elite that Africa, as Marcus Garvey actually said, Africa for Africans. Right now, Africa is for, for everybody else except, <laughs> except for the Africans themselves. <laughs> Yeah, we can't afford that anymore. <laughs> yeah, it's quite yeah. sad. It's quite sad. And uh, I mean, the thing is, I think first we need mm -hmm. to learn to keep yeah. some of the smartest people in I the agree. continent stay in the continent because the moment they leave, I agree. we have to start all over again, right? And no, this I agree with you 100%. In fact, as you speak, I'm, I'm telling you, I myself, I, I'm, I'm extremely tormented. I would rather be teaching in Uganda, of course. But, uh, you know, first of all, a uh, I have a, a writer who's you know now international recognized. He wrote, he wrote he writes a column for Black Star News in Uganda. He wrote a book. You may have heard of him by now. The greedy barbarian. His name is Kakwenza Rufira Bashaya. He was arrested, tortured. He wrote another book, uh, Banana Republic, where writing is treason. Arrested again, tortured. A third time arrested in Georgia in December. And now after international outcry, you know, it was released. So now he had to get out of the country. He's in Germany now. Uh, now, as he was being tortured, this is what he just told me last week, because I had him on my radio show earlier this week on Tuesday. He said he was being asked by the people torturing him. 
why do you write for Black Star News? You know, how much does he pay you to write for Black Star News? Mm. How do you know him? How long have you known him? Do you know if he plans to come back to Uganda and all that? <laughs> so you imagine, you know? Yeah. So that is part of the dilemma that, um, you know, some of us in positions to want to contribute directly on the continent, you know, we are faced with these type of challenges, you know? Mm. And that is, uh, you know, very unfortunate. That's very sad. But uh, even then, as I said, we need to empower our youth, make them more demanding. And I think we can do that. Young people, young people can really become very creative and productive with the right guidance, you know? Yeah. All of us need guidance. I am who I am because I'm guided by uh, the examples of people that lived before. Which is history. Lives. History, exactly. Uh, Malcolm X is, uh, is one of my heroes. I respect and Malcolm I, tremendously. And, and I've watched his, his yeah, I've also you know? watched his documentary on who killed Malcolm X, trying to understand mm -hmm. him too. Yeah. So, so I say this to say that if we provide the right messages, we too will be able to inspire others, you see? Yeah. And that's the value of having a platform like the one that uh, uh, you have. And that is why I personally am a very optimistic person. Because I know that with the right messages, you can transform people. I see that every semester, my students come to my classes, you know, certain individuals within, I would say within maybe six weeks, they're not the same individuals anymore. So for example, uh, I've been teaching this semester. This is the fifth week now, right? For this semester. I can see the transformation already. My last class yesterday, at the end of the class, how do you know this transformation? When students don't leave immediately, when you say class is over, they come to you, they want to continue the conversation. The conversation. Yes, so one student told me, I'm learning more in this class than in all my other classes combined. Another student told me, you've opened up my brain. And that's the best kind of compliment you can hear. When somebody says you opened up their brain, it means now they're looking at things in a different way, number one. Number two, they're now also going out and learning by themselves, you see? And yeah. then I had a, a third student who told me, and this is, uh, and you rarely hear this from students. Students want to leave class as soon as possible. One student told me that, Professor, if you extend this class by another half hour, I'm sure the other students won't mind. <laughs> is it? Yeah. So, and I say all this to say that, yes, People can be transformed, give them the right messages, and they will take it and run with it. And that's what I mean when I say, I am very optimistic for Africa's future. We have the resources. That is the one thing that the colonials, they plundered as much as possible, took as much as possible on ships, and in recent years on cargo planes, mm. what have you, but they will never be able to take the resources we have in the ground. Now we need to match the resources we have in the ground with the intellectual capacity of Africans, right? Yeah. To direct those, those resources for the betterment of Africa. That is the challenge that remains. Absolutely. And also speaking about Kakwenza, the book that he wrote was fiction, right? It was yeah. fiction, but the regime too, saw too much Familiarity in the fiction. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can't do that in Africa. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 So, but, but now, I mean, I'm very hopeful. I want, you know, I want to see youth come into leadership, into a responsible position. Because, you know, as you said earlier, our people are very intelligent. Our people are very creative. I had this... Uh, wealthy French individual who's an investor in African countries. I was speaking with him about two years ago. 
And he said he's amazed by the level of intelligence and creativity that he sees throughout African countries. He said what they lack are just the capital, the capital to put their ideas and talent into practice, you know? Yeah. And, and he said he, he's always looking for small projects that just need uh, capital resources uh, uh, to put their, their products into the market, you know? Yeah, that so is if true. If you have somebody saying this, then you know it's not only coming from me. Because you say, oh, yeah, this is Milton. <laughs> he's, he's biased, yeah. he's very pro-Africa, so mm. he's going to say this thing. But no, this was coming from an observer coming from a European country who acknowledged that, yes, the creativity is just, you know, he said he actually was surprised and shocked by the amount of entrepreneurial drive and creativity that our people have. That is why I'm very optimistic. We, we really have a lot of creative people. And speaking about creativity, I don't, I don't know if you have seen there, this uh, a group of, of, of boys in, uh, in Nigeria, and they're actually creating movies using their phone. I don't know if you have seen some of the yes. clips, but it just goes forward to show how creative, you know, young people in the African continent are. Yes, and yes. Yes, I've seen that. And I think I saw one in Tanzania as well. I saw one uh, from a, 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 a young, young, young man and young lady. <laughs> and I think what they were doing was they were, they were uh, lip syncing. Oh, the exactly. Yes, songs, right. <laughs> yes, and yes. I was, I was amazed by their creativity, you know? <laughs> yeah. And so they but actually. No, we, we have the mm. talents. We have the talents, you know, we do. And and speaking about the two the two Tanzanians, they were even invited uh, by the ambassador of India in in Tanzania, mm -hmm. and the Indian Prime Minister himself said that you know young people in his country should be doing that, right? Mm -hmm. And you can just mm -hmm. see how far it goes to show you that you know Africans yeah. they have the creative mind, right? We just need yeah. to be able, to, like our government need to be able to yeah just push them a little bit forward, right? Yeah. It's like invest yeah. in them, right? Fund them, and then they will do wonders, right? Absolutely. Because now they don't have the resources right but then the things yeah. that they're doing it's amazing like it blows yeah. your mind when you take a look at them right so it's yeah. true that we really have uh, amazing african creatives and i think we mm -hmm. just need to be able to push them forward and you know just give them the space and the opportunity to be able to compete with the global market because they Absolutely. they can do that right they can definitely do that yeah, and, and they're actually, it's actually a brother and a sister, right? And uh, and the Prime Minister, of course, uh, Narendra Modi, praised the duo, yeah. right? And mm -hmm. said that, you know, they're amazing because they have become social yeah. media stars, right? Um, right. And, and, and the name of, of one of the... Impressed. I was very impressed with that talent. And when I see stuff like that, it gives me even much, much hope. More hope for Africa's future, you know? Yeah, yeah. So one of the duo's name is Kili. And yeah, they have been okay. really doing amazing. Kili, Paul, and Neema. Those are their names. So if there's anyone who wants to check them out, just go on YouTube, search Kili, Paul, and Neema from Tanzania. You'll definitely see them. And yeah, it just goes forward to show how creative Africa is. And uh, so we, we were speaking about uh, Uganda, right? We were speaking about Uganda. Yes. And, and I watched the documentary, How to Become a Tyrant on Netflix. Right. I love watching right. documentaries because... I think that's one right. of the best ways to be learning about things and dig deep into events. Yeah. And of in course. the documentary, you also spoke about Idi Amin, right? Uh, mm -hmm. The Ugandan dictator who actually, mm -hmm. he, he lost badly to, to Julius Nyerere. <laughs> badly, yes, right? Of course. Um, Tanzania taught him a lesson, yeah. Yeah, it surely did. It surely did. And I think, you know, given the fact that, you know, um, Kakwenza was asked about you, and you mm. spoke about Idi Amin in the documentary. Well, I don't think you have really made good friends over there. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. But, but, but that's fine. That's fine. Because at the end of the day, it's not about the individual. At the yeah. end of the day, is I care for Africa. Mm -hmm. I love the African continent. I love my people. Uh, I think the bad leadership that we have, whether it's a dictatorship in Uganda or any other African country, it's, it's transitory. It's not permanent. You know, it will go. Mm. It will go and Africa will be able to unleash its full ten talent and potential, you see? And that is why I want change, not only for Uganda, I want change for any African country where the leadership is not delivering on behalf of the African people. In South Africa right now, 
there's, as you know, a lot of pressure on the land issue, right? So even though South Africa has a democratic system and government, yeah. the system and government democracy should extend to the economic realm as well, not just the political realm, you see? So for example, Steve Biko, one of my heroes as well. Steve Biko. There's a short speech on YouTube uh, by Steve Biko. It's about 24 minutes, right? It's not a speech, but it's an interview. He's asking questions. And Steve Biko said, if at the end of apartheid, we just have replacing European leaders with Africans, and then that's it, then it would be as if there was no change in the system, as if apartheid just continued with a small black elite that is now becoming enriched. And unfortunately, sadly, that's the situation today in South Africa. So you have Europeans, about 8% of the population, 0.8, right? Yeah. Controlling more than 70%, 70 of the land and most of the economy. That's unacceptable, you know? Yeah. So even in South Africa, they need much more radical change to empower the people who have suffered under centuries of colonialism, right? The ancestors. And now South Africa is almost like the typical neo-colonial African state. Of course, it's much more advanced than many, most African countries. It's relatively much more stable compared to many African countries, but it has an explosive uh, uh, condition of inequity that is not sustainable. So if they don't address it, it may unravel very quickly and become like uh, uh, any other African country where we see so much uh, social uh, strife. So they need to deal with that. Because what happens in South Africa affects the entire Southern Africa and Central Africa and the entire continent, you see? So that's why my focus cannot be only on Uganda or any other individual African country. I see them as a collective. And that's the way we have to get more Africans to start thinking. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And speaking about South Africa and earlier on, you spoke about the power that, you know, young people have in terms of uh, of the government, right? And the influence in the government. And and I'm, I'm glad at least we have Julius Malema. I mean, if you follow him, you can see the influence that he of has course. he has on young people. Right. And he's at least mm -hmm. the one who is trying to fight how things have always been. And he also sp he's also been speaking a lot about the land issue and that the land should yes. be given back to the people. So it's quite amazing right. that we at least have individuals like him who are actually fighting mm -hmm. for such things. Right. And it's because of him that the ANC, the ruling party, is now also speaking on the land issue. Because obviously, in each successive election cycle, the ANC margin of victory has been going down. And the, uh, the economic freedom fighters, which is Malema's party, are still relatively small, but they keep expanding each election cycle, which means people are listening to the message they're talking about which, of course, is the issue of the land in South Africa. Yeah, yeah. And he launched his Economic Freedom Fighters Party in Ju July of 2013. And, you know, now you can see that, you know, what he's fighting for, you know, the, the, the leaders out there, the, big, the, the individuals who are actually in position of power, they are hearing him, right? And they are doing things. So as how you said, like you cannot be given something that you are not asking, right? And I think mm -hmm. it's good that he's one of the individuals who are, who are actually asking. Right. Earlier on, you said that you, you, Malcolm X is among the people who influence you. Mm -hmm. And I, I hope you probably have seen his documentary, right? Who Killed Malcolm yes, X. Yes, yes. That's nice. Yes, so, so, so Gerard Horn, I am sure you should be familiar with him. So he, he, he published the WEB Du Bois. He's going to be interviewing me next month. <laughs> wow. That is on, on, amazing. About, about my book, right. So I'm gonna oh, my be, God. That is really yeah, amazing. My, he was one of my heroes as well. But go ahead. Right. Great. Okay, I think I, I would also speak. I also have to get him on the on the podcast and have a conversation with him. So, so for yeah. those who don't know him, I mean, he published W. E. B. Du Bois, and he also published right. books on neglected episodes of world history, right? And right. and he spoke about the documentary and said that he do not believe that the, the documentary is the actual representation of Malcolm's life and what really happened. I mean, what's your take on that? Well, um, you know, it's always been very contentious. And I have to say that I would have to uh, defer to him. You know, he's done a lot more research. He has uh, certainly 
uh, much, much more knowledge. So I would accept probably his conclusion. Mm. My own investigation on Malcolm's life has been focused primarily on his uh, connection to Africa. And in fact, that is uh, my intention to eventually do a, a graphic book about Malcolm and Africa, because Malcolm saw the power of um, making the connection between uh, Africans in diaspora, aka African Americans, and the African continent uh, for several reasons. First of all, he wanted Africans in America, you know, African Americans, to stop thinking of themselves as minorities, you see? Because when you think of yourself, you're a minority, you always think you are, you, you always be dependent, you see? Yes. You think of, you internalize that. So you don't have a, a, you don't have a, a very big impression of yourself, first of all, when you constantly keep thinking of so your of your minority. But Malcolm said we are connected to our family on the African continent. You see? So at that time, obviously the you know, the numbers were already hundreds of millions of Africans. You know, today the population is like more like 1.3 billion at yeah. that time, several hundreds of million. That's how we should start thinking of ourselves, number one. Number two, he knew that because of being members of the United Nations, African leaders could bring issues such as the racial discrimination against African Americans to the world organization. Speak about it at the UN. And that would uh, galvanize global attention on the atrocities being committed against African Americans and force the United States to actually address the issue seriously, knowing that the whole world is now watching. And that is why he attended the uh, OAU meeting in, uh, in, uh, in Cairo, in Egypt, and he was able to meet many African leaders. You know, he met uh, Milton Obote, he met Julius Nyerere, met Kwame Nkrumah, he met Nassar himself, Messi Kuture, he met uh, Azikiwe, we met Joma Kenyatta, we met uh, others who are not presidents like uh, uh, Mohammed Abdurrahman Babu, we met uh, Tom Boya, we met uh, Oginga Odinga, you know, the father of Raila. So he was making all these connections in Africa and trying to get the leaders to take the issue of the atrocities against African Americans to the UN. And I personally believe that uh, that contributed to Malcolm's being assassinated because wherever he was traveling in African countries, he was either being followed by uh, CIA or the U.S. ambassador in each and every African country that Malcolm went to would make public statements to try to undermine the message that Malcolm was delivering to the African country. And some were referring to him as a black radical or black racist, you know. Yeah. Uh, so that means they were very concerned about Malcolm potentially succeeded in building that very strong relationship uh, between African Americans and the, the sisters and brothers on yeah, Africa. On as Africa. a result of his work, I came across a New York Times story many years ago while doing research of a statement by Uganda's then Prime Minister, Milton Obote, condemning the racist attacks against African Americans in Alabama. This was on the front page of the New York Times. Nowadays, you don't find that. African leaders don't condemn the abusers, for example, the police violence against African Americans in this country. But Obote made that statement, it was due to the work the groundwork of Malcolm. So imagine, had that type of uh, interaction increased, had Malcolm not been, been killed, I think he would have had even much more significant impact. Uh, so that is the basis of my interest. That is the focus of my research. And hopefully by next year, I'll be able to uh, finish working on a book on Malcolm and Africa. That's really nice. I'm looking forward to the book. And after you publish the book, I read it will definitely have another another conversation about it right because i think he's also one of those people that we need to learn about and and just like every other african leader 
he knew they're after him and he knew that yes, they're going to take him out like he knew that yes, and but but what he said was that i think he was asked in an interview aren't you afraid of no what you are saying and everything else and he said i i think he said i am a dead man right so i have nothing to fear or whatsoever yeah. and because he knew at any time they were going to take him down and even the day yeah. that he was delivering the speech where they took him down they shot him he had, i think before he went he actually said he's worried about his life that day right and that's yeah. exactly the day that they took him down but what he yeah. said that is really profound he said that you can kill a man but you cannot kill his ideas right absolutely. and and that's why i'm also that's saying that's why we are we're discussing him today because of that absolutely absolutely and that is why we have to so the three books that you have recommended i'll definitely put them in the link below and people have to go and check them i'll also add your two books in the in the link below because Thank if you. if you absolutely if you want if you want to be educated about the african continent right you have to read history right because that's 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 how you build going up right you build from yeah. the ground which is the history and then you go all the way up absolutely so, Okay, so I have like I'll, I'll we'll speak about two more things and then I think yeah because we have spent a lot sure. of time and we could keep on going forever and forever. Sure. So we spoke about Malcolm X documentary it was made by Netflix, I believe, and you mm-hmm. also worked on the documentary of how to become a tyrant, which was made by Netflix. So how was right. your experience working on the documentary with Netflix? Right? I mean, is it like did you have you know did you have the the freedom to be able to bring in what you think is right or you are research as how you found it? without any influence? I was able to bring in what I thought was right. Obviously, I, was, uh, I didn't have the freedom uh, to decide what would come up in the final product. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, so, so that's was... how I would answer the question. Hmm. I wanted to draw the fact that Amin was actually a creation by the British. It was a creation of the British and later on Israel. The British used Amin during the colonial regime to help suppress the uprising in Kenya by the Kenya Land and Freedom Army. The British derogatively referred to them as Mau Mau, but they were not Mau Mau. That word does not have any translation in any of the African languages. That term was uh, created by some British public relations specialists who knew the word sounded very menacing to the European mind. And that's how they became so-called Mama. But they they knew what they wanted because the official name was Kenya Land and Freedom Army. They wanted the land back and they wanted Uhuru. So I mean, as a member of the King's African Rifles, the colonial army, was very efficient in hunting and killing many of the fighters of the Kenya uh, Land and Freedom Army. And that is why the British kept promoting him. You know, they liked that he was efficient in killing his fellow sisters and brothers, you know? So at the time of independence, they left Uganda with a ticking time bomb. It was just a question of time. But then, of course, you know, Obote also used the men when he had the political conflict with the Kabaka of Buganda, who was also, at the same time, the president of Uganda when Obote was the executive prime minister. So he used Amin and the army to suppress the Kabaka after the Kabaka had ordered him to remove the central government from Buganda region, where is, which is where the capital was. Uh, so, I mean, it was used by both the British by, and then by Obote. And then later on, when Obote developed a closer relationship with uh, Tanzania's Julius Nyerere, and he came up with a, a policy document called the move to the left, he was going to reorient Uganda's politics more in sync with Tanzania to nationalize uh, the resources, uh, multi- yes, the assets as well. So obviously the British didn't like that. <laughs> so that is why the <laughs> British uh, encouraged Amin uh, with the help of Israel, because Israel was training uh, Uganda's uh, military as well. And they had a good relationship with the Amin, the Israeli trainers. So basically they 
inspired Amin to overthrow Obote. Obote. And then, of course, the rest is history with the regime of terror. And I discussed that aspect as well. But if you notice, if you watch the documentary, none of that made it in the final cut. So that was my experience. And also, another part that I also presented was that the legacy of the Amin regime has not ended in Uganda. So today we have a contemporary uh, dictator in Uganda who has learned a lot of the skills of Idi Amin, just as ruthless, but much more uh, uh, intellectually trained and educated. So he knows how to put on a better front. He does not abuse uh, you know, the people who feed him, like Idi Amin did, <laughs> abusing the same countries who are uh, supporting him initially, actually. So that also was missing in the, in the final product that you saw. Well, for those watching this, I'm glad that they're getting this exclusive because as my, like myself, I watched the documentary, but you know, these are not the things that I have seen in the documentary or would have found in the documentary, right? You also spoke about the Israel influence and Israel has been granted the observer status in the African Union. Right. right and and faki has approved it and we had some backlash from some african countries saying that this is a decision that we need to see it as african as african leaders discuss and Correct. then make a vote and then later on they chose a, a committee of five countries i think Correct. if i'm not mistaken to actually to actually discuss it and then come up with what they think is right and then and then leaders make a decision from there right Correct, correct. Why do you think we still have such challenges in the African continent? I mean, this isn't something that we should even be speaking about in the first place, right? Like, and right. like, even if you are the leader of the organization, you can't make a decision without involving other leaders of states in such a, a crucial decision, right? Despite the fact that Israel has ties with, with over 46 African countries, still, I think right. African countries had to sit down together and discuss about it, right? Because... People have been speaking now about, you know, why the world is now, okay, not why, but, you know, the world is currently focusing on Ukraine and Russia, which will probably mm -hmm. be the last thing they're speaking about. But then mm -hmm. why isn't Russia, isn't the world focusing on Israel, right? And what it has been doing to the Palestines, right? And right. saying that, you know, it's human right violation. All right. So um, we're discussing this today. Uh, we're talking this in the 21st century because of the weakness of African continent. So Israel has much more global impact and influence than all the Af individual African countries, right? Yeah. And that, to me, also sums up the tragedy. Actually, to the biggest, the, the, what proof how impotent and weak Africa is was the NATO war on Libya. When NATO, a collection of European countries, came and bombed an African country for almost a year, we don't even know how many people were killed, right, in Libya. And supposedly they were intervening to stop Gaddafi from, quote unquote, killing his own people. So they said, okay, We'll do the killing of young people for you. <laughs> so the bomb for almost a year. We don't know how many people are killed. We don't know how much destruction of property they committed. And Africa could not stand up and say, no, whatever issues are involved in Africa, this is an African problem that we will resolve. No European country will drop a single bomb. On Africa. They are not able to do that. Think about that. That exposed that Africa is not yet independent, not yet a ruling. Africa mm -hmm. is completely impotent, right? So that's what this issue with Israel reminds me of. They did not want it to be debated because they knew the result was being no. Right? Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. So how did they make sure it would not be a no answer. They went to the chair of the African Union Commission, Mr. Mohamed Faki, and they had him to underhandedly agree, and they read the 
constitution and they saw some loopholes, you know, that unless there was significant opposition, yeah. this is something he had the power to do. And he presumed there would not be significant opposition because Israel has relationship with all these countries as you, you see how slick it is and how disingenuous it is, you see? But it comes back to not having power. And then number two, I don't know what the amount is today, but when I checked a few years ago, 60% of the African Union budget comes from outside. So that should also answer your question. The people who write the check are the ones that get uh, their policy or their agenda implemented. That's the second problem. Well, that's true. The people who write the check are the ones who control you, right? Then they tell you the decisions Absolutely. and everything else. Mm -hmm. And and so speaking about 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 Russia, about Israel, and also speaking about how you know we we still can't say that you know no, you can't bomb with because we don't want you to do that, right? And we have the power to tell you no, right? I think the same was with Mali, right? Like Mali didn't reach out to African countries for help with the insurgencies that they are occurring, but they went to France, right? And then right. and then later on they went to Russia, right? Which shows that right. we still have a long way to go in terms of trusting each African, I mean, trusting each other, right? And then being able to kind of like reach out to each other when you have problems rather than going to France miles away and, you know, you have countries close to you and you, you're not even reaching out to them to ask for help because it's not like they can't help you or they don't have the power to, they definitely have the power to do that. But, you know, it's still that, it's so unfortunate that that's still the decision that we even start yeah. thinking about. Yeah, the, 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 the neo-colonial, you know, as Ngugi Wationgo, the Kenyan writer. The Kenyan writer. Book, in this highly recommended book, the title is Decolonizing the Mind. That's Decolonizing the Mind. Yeah, we need to do that. Uh, we absolutely have to. Both down and country. On the, on the, so last one, last one. This has been quite an mm -hmm. interesting conversation. I want to proceed, but... <laughs> so, with, with Russia and Ukraine, yeah. we had African countries that did not take a vote, right? Mm -hmm. What do you think about that? Well, I mean, obviously, Russia is now playing a bigger and influential role in many African countries. So in the past, you know, was, was it when it were issues related to uh, you know, the U.S., you know, China, the issue would always come up, you know. You have to make a decision. How are you going to weigh? And then during the Cold War era, when it was the U.S. and the West versus the Soviet Union. So a bit of that is at play right now. It's not a coincidence that over the last five years, Russia has expanded its influence in many African countries, right? With some level of investment, uh, deploying the troops, as I said earlier. And... Uh, you know, because some, obviously African countries, even the ones that are not, even the ones who are governed by incompetent leadership, don't like to be dependent strictly on one side, you know? You can't put see the, the eggs in one basket. Exactly. <laughs> so they see the benefits of having some, some latitude and flexibility. And that's where this issue comes up. They don't want to be seen, the ones who did not vote, to be seen openly as aggressive uh, toward uh, Russia. And then there are those that also realize that it's not a very simplistic Ukraine versus Russia issue. They know the geopolitics. They know the politics in the back room involved. They know the US and NATO obviously would prefer for uh, Ukraine to become a member of NATO. And of course, Russia finds that completely unacceptable to have a NATO country bordering. Uh, and those issues are not being widely discussed, by the way. And I think it's, it's actually very relevant because if you recall during the Cuban Missile Crisis, right, the US pushed back very hard because Kennedy said, no, we cannot allow Cuba to be turned into a front line of uh, Soviet, uh, what they call communist imperialism. 
right? So Soviet imperialism, 90, away, 90 miles away from the shores of the United States. That was the logic and argument that they used. And they were willing to even go to the extent of a nuclear confrontation. So I think it would help for Americans and some people in the West to then turn the shoes and try to imagine how Russia might also feel. And even by saying that doesn't mean anybody is condoning the invasion. But at the end of the day, I don't believe there's a military solution to issues such as this. You see? Yeah. I think the diplomatic issue had not been exhausted, but I also think that media, particularly the large corporate media, are not trying to present why Russia would have such a hostile view toward Ukraine becoming a part of NATO. You know? So that's my assessment. Yeah, yeah. And actually, it's 17 countries, African countries that abstained from voting. That's right. a huge number. And given our it influence of 25% in the UN, I think, I think, yeah, we have a say in that too. And, and yeah, I mean, people have different yeah. takes on, you know, for those who agreed or disagreed and those who abstained. But I personally, I think, uh, I think, as you said, you know, like you can't put all your eggs in one basket. Absolutely. And, you know, one other thing I would like to say before we sign off, is this simplistic way that corporate media presents the story. You know, when they pick one side as good, that one side is absolutely 100% good. One side is bad, 100% bad. bad. Devil versus angel. The world is not made up like that. So it's why more complex. Because even though Ukraine is victim of a war of aggression, invasion, we saw the authorities in Ukraine discriminating against Africans. Who are trying to get away? Who are trying to? Yeah, Locking exactly. Africans I saw that from boarding the train, from, from leaving people to the border, and then even when they got to the border in Poland, blocking them from leaving. Some of them sleeping out in the cold winter, two or three days with no food, even with their children, babies. This is outright racist. But the major media were trying to avoid this story because they had already presented Ukraine as angels. So now when you show that the angels can also be racist, they think Americans would not appreciate that. Corporate media cannot be a part of censoring the story. If you're going to show the good, show the bad and the ugly as well. Don't ignore racist discrimination against Africans. So the corporate media need to be called out on that issue as well. So I just thought I would bring that out as well. Absolutely, that's true. And I mean, we can't trust, we can't trust corporate media to tell us the both sides of the story because they always pick one side of the story and it's always the one that favors them not the one that we really want to hear and at the end of the day if we have individuals who are not researching that's what we end up being fed on that is why the we have platforms such as this one and let's cherish it and let's make sure that more listeners know about your platform absolutely and 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 it's it's been quite an honor having a conversation with you because I learned a it's lot. My pleasure. And and that's why I always like doing long form podcasts because we really get to deep into things and not just you know brush them up and just tell one side of the story. Understood. Right? Understood. Exactly. Absolutely. I appreciate this so much. You let me know when you want me back, and I will be at your call and service. This was quite an interesting conversation. It's two hours and a yeah. half, but it feels like you know ten five minutes. I, so I didn't, I didn't feel it at all. So this was absolutely yeah, let, amazing. Let me, I really loved it. Let me know when you when you want me back, and we'll plan it. Okay. That's awesome. Thank you for that, and I surely will reach out and uh, have a good day. Okay. Bless you, and stay strong, young man. Thank you. I surely will. Thank you.